Today at our table, a restaurant with one of the country's most exotic selections of cheese. And to its left is a King's Cheddar, one of the two remaining great farmhouse cheddars still in existence from Somerset in southwest England, about a year old. Uh, with just the right wine. Oh, and you just smell. There's a million things you, you know, you smell in there. And a melt-in-your-mouth gnocchi recipe from the kitchen of Chef Terence Brennan. Usually gnocchi are made out of semolina or potato. This one, we're going to make out of she smell piccata, and it's going to be the lightest gnocchi you've ever tasted. And a guest who truly loves food. I am crazy for Fagua. Harry Smith, the host of A&E's biography series. All right, so why are we going to Pichelin Restaurant? Because it's in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, you called and you said, would you do the show? And I thought to myself, where should we do this? Where should we do this? And I thought, I have one of the best restaurants in all of New York City right on my block. So Pichelin is it. Pichelin? Yes. Let's go to the corner table. Like about Pichelin. Why, of all the restaurants in New York, in mm -hmm. this crazy city, did you bring us here? Well, it's it's it really is our neighborhood restaurant. This is uh, Pretty very, nice very, one. very, very close to uh, to where we live. Chef Brennan does an amazing job. The ingredients are always really, really fresh. The preparation is terrific. They really care about details here. The breads are always great. They're always quite fresh. There, they're succulent, even down to the plates. Right, this is Pichelin. Look at the plates. There are olives on the plates. So everything is put together right here. And if you're a neighbor and you live in the neighborhood and you can call at the last minute, if you have a little wiggle room and he has a little wiggle, <laughs> wiggle room, room, then sometimes they can, you can even get uh, even get a table. You know, you could sell things on television very easily. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd be pretty good at that. Let's take let's take a look at the appetizers. All right. and see see what we should order here. There you go. Um, how about sautéed sweetbreads? In the move for a calves gland? I'm not going to do that at lunch today, but right. I'll tell you what I will absolutely do because I am not, I am crazy for foie gras. I am nuts for it. I'm all you know, and You're I'm always alone. interested. I'm always interested in it. I like to uh, see how it's prepared differently, the textures, where it comes from. Um, there are some American foie gras now. I don't even know if they would call you know dare to call it that. But um, I'm al I always just get a kick out of it. Well, you live right on the block. Are, yeah. you, are you ever tempted to send out for a little foie gras? <laughs> <laughs> Terrence, uh, how about a little stuff? So you want the what you want then is is the. Uh, foie gras terrine right. of the day. Mm -hmm. Some of the other appetizer selections that the restaurant was preparing that day were the spring vegetable salad, the sautéed sweetbreads, and the fricassee of Maine Pemaquid oysters. And there it is, your foie Look gras. Oh, oh. And what are these little guys? These are black mission figs, yeah. house-made prosciutto, <laughs> duck prosciutto, right. and the terrine of foie gras with a black truffle pistachio vinaigrette. Look at that. Country toast. See with the figs and the and the oh house made prosciutto. Oh, I can't even stand it. You love food. I do. I'm crazy for it. Oh, look at that. Oh. And the carpaccio tuna. Beautiful. And Harry, you know we can share. Yeah. I, well, that's I will I will I only agreed to do this if we could. Uh, we can we can you can have whatever you want. And to accompany the foie gras, Harry enjoyed the 1990s Chateau Roussac Sauterne. Just a little taste for the yeah. Because you have all of that round flavors and everything from the uh, from the foie gras, and there's a lot of uh, I wouldn't call it you know so much fatty flavors, but you also have it with the with the meat and everything else, and then just a uh, right to make it just right. That's, that's not very much. That's that's a very small serving. I'll you take just a, <laughs> I'll take an actual sip here in just a second. Harry gained see? much of his vast oh, knowledge right. of food while hosting CBS this morning. He must have had a marvelous actual education in food on the CBS Morning Show. I mean, eight years. How many food demos, as we call them in the business, <laughs> do you think you've done in eight years? I have to confess that at one point, uh, oh, maybe six or seven years into the show, I turned to the executive producer and I said, if I stir fry another vegetable, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> because it was, you know, because you go from great chefs to great restaurants to that whole thing with you know, food to survive and food that's going to change your life and every, we were stir frying every other day and I went, yeah, let me go out and cover Any a news story stories? someplace. Any disaster stories? No real, no real, uh, you know what, I have to think, I have to think who it was because uh, I always tasted everything and people used to bring such great energy and great attitudes to the show and 
and I, I can't remember for the life of me who it was, but I remember going to taste whatever was prepared, and there w really was one time when I just wanted to spit it out. Oh. <laughs> because it was so you remember what it was? horrible. I couldn't, couldn't tell you in a million years. Well, have a but I think, I think what it was, it was supposed to be good for you. It was one of those, you know, things that was supposed to be, well, we'll use a little less of this, or we'll use a little, a little, a little less of this, and you know what it, it tastes like? It, use, it tastes like, that's what you, you know, it tastes like you're cheating. Uh -huh. so. Well, you're not cheating here, because no, no, this, this is good is... for you because you like it so yeah. much. But what Harry really likes uh -huh. is his marriage to broadcaster Andrea Joyce. How did you first meet your wife? Um, we broke the cardinal rule of broadcasting. You work together. We work together. Uh, you never date the person you work with. Well, and many, many, many you? years ago in local news, we were both working in Denver at the CBS station, mm -hmm. and um, she was anchoring the new news. She was brand new. She was this big hotshot anchor they brought in from Detroit. Was the fact that you were working together on the air sort of impeding your making something happen? Mm, you know, in an odd, odd, oddest of all possible ways, it helped us uh, cement a friendship first, oh, wow. and that's what has really served us so well all these years. Isn't that really the basis of a great relationship, though? Friends first, if you can mm -hmm. really be friends first and, and have love grow on that. So well, you have to tell us something. How did love bloom? What happened? Uh, we went on a convenience date. Uh, we used to do that a lot because I was very active in the community there and had a lot of responsibilities, and uh, we, were, we were convenience dating. Uh, it was uh, opera. Um, it was uh, Puccini. Puccini? It, well, you could, you could die for Puccini, and, uh, and it was Turandot. We were sitting next to each other, and during the great aria, and it's just, it's so drippy and fabulous and terrific. It's so romantic and our knees touch and we lean into one another in the, in the seats as the opera goes on. And at the end of the night, she's driving me home at the end of this convenience day. And I said, may I kiss you goodnight? And she said, none of those buddy kisses. <laughs> <laughs> you like a good glass of wine. Yeah, and you know when it was in a, poured in a great glass like this, it really helps. Because I think part of the, the real experience is really the olfactory experience, the being able to really take it in, mm -hmm. to really take it in. Oh, and you just smell. There's a million things you, you, know, you smell in there. It and it's smells just, like uh, nighttime. <laughs> it does. That's a good line. Picheline has an elegant French decor that includes custom designed china, crystal chandeliers, and rich tapestries. Some of the items on the menu include entrees like exotic spice squab, grilled roger, and free range chicken with spring yeah. vegetables and potato well, puree. Done, Chef right. Brennan showed us how to prepare the sheep's milk regatta gnocchi. This one. We're going to make out a sheet milk ricotta, and it's going to be the lightest gnocchi you've ever tasted. To make the dough, Terence combines sheep's milk ricotta cheese, flour, one egg, and Parmesan cheese. And what's very important is not to overmix, not to overmix the batter. This is how the gnocchi become very gummy. You ever had those like real gummy gnocchi in a in a restaurant? Well, that's because they overwork the gnocchi. Once so the dough is formed, Terence then gentle. rolls it until it's a quarter so of an inch thick nice and cuts it into pieces. one inch pieces. Then I'm going to take the fork and I'm going to make a little thumb indention on the back of a fork over the tunes and we're just going to roll it off. And what this does, it creates some ridges, also a little dimple, so that the sauce kind of will, will, will sit in that. When you eat your gnocchi, you have a little bit of sauce with your gnocchi. The gnocchi are then are blanched cooked, in boiling salted the water. Gnocchis, They'll float to the top when cooked. So they've risen to the top, and that's our sign that they're, they're done. And I'm going to shock them in some, an ice bath and let them cool off completely. This way you can just toss them in a little bit of oil and put them back in the refrigerator, lightly covered with a damp towel. And then right before you're ready to serve the gnocchi, you just heat them back up in some hot water again. Once Terrence has reheated the gnocchi, he adds it, along with some blanched asparagus, to a creamy morel sauce. He looks like, mm, like butter. <laughs> it's so good. Mm, well, it I, does melt. You know what? Just don't even, don't even Jump give me in. any attention here. No, sharing is my middle name here. 
Oh, that's lovely. Let's talk a little bit about CBS. 13 years at CBS, mm -hmm. eight years doing the CBS morning show. Right. It was widely reported that you were hoping, campaigning to get right. a position on 60 Minutes too. Yeah, actually it was 60 Minutes, the, the Sunday night show. The Sunday said, night. If they don't give me the, if they don't get, you know, don't give me the, the big show, then I'm just gonna walk. It was the big show, not 60 no, Minutes I'm just, too? I'm just kidding. No, 60 Minutes too, right? Right. And then it was reported that you were disappointed that you didn't get the mm -hmm. job. You know, I heard about this. I wondered all along this question. Why? Why do you think they passed on Harry Smith for, you, for that job? Do you have any idea? It will be a mystery that I'll carry with me to the grave, I suppose. Were you angry? You must have been angry when you go for a job. I mean, I've been passed more than Saul, you know, right. for things that I want. <laughs> but I know what it's like. How did you feel about this? Um, really disappointed, yeah. really disappointed because I think there was a part of me that I knew who a lot of the producers who were going to be working on that show. There was a lot of anticipation about around CBS about it. Funny, it's only, what, maybe seven or eight months ago. Seems like a thousand years ago already. We have In the moment, it was quite huge. Another thing I have to ask you, CBS yes. Morning Show, right. the perennial number three in the right. race. All those headlines, <laughs> USA Today, Wall right. Street Journal. Was this like a joke over there? Did you no. say we're number three? No. We're always going to no. be number three? No. No. Did you get a loser mentality at That's, all? It's hard to continue to fight the fight. Hard to just, you know, yeah. over and over and over and over again because we felt like we had lots of editorial victories on a day by day basis. But when you're in number three, it's kind of hard sometimes to scratch over and say, look at us, look at us, look at us. Because you, as you know, Audiences move glacially yeah, in, the, in in that time period. So I think our primary fight was to be the best show editorially, maybe do more news than the other mm -hmm. guys, and felt you know feel like quality will will win out in the end. After five or six or seven or eight years of that, it gets it gets pretty tough. It's understandable. Yeah. So, so sometimes there was a sense of frustration. Had to be. Sure, of course. Yeah. You know. Watch but, us! <laughs> please! What are you watching in the mornings? Truth. Arthur. <laughs> Arthur, it's on PBS when the kids are done <laughs> eating breakfast. Arthur. And their beds are made, and the laundry's in the laundry room, and their clothes, and the homework is ready. Everything is set, and they, you know, they're, they're ready to go out the door. They get to watch Arthur before they go to school. What so about that's you? What goes on. What, do you watch morning television? I read the papers. You don't. So you did it, but you don't particularly watch it? Not really. Mm -hmm. now, I, I would say that if I'm compelled to watch, I'll watch, I watch the Today Show. You watch the Today I Show. I watch the Today Show. You know, I might graze over and look around a little bit, but there's a big part of me that says, you know what, kind of been there, kind of done that, and that's a, that's a chapter in my life. Uh, we get three papers in our, morning, in our house in the morning, so I grab a cup of coffee and I'm ripping through papers. I know what I can give you that can make you happy. What's that? Cheese. Yeah. <laughs> After dinner here, nice. you have to have cheese. Remember when you were a little kid and you went to your first fancy restaurant? Mm -hmm. Very and well. you'd go and you walk past that cart and it was dripping with this globulous forms of uh, and covered with uh, and just don't get near me with that thing. <laughs> well, this is the absolute antithesis of that. When we return, the cheese man cometh. But that's not all. Oh my gosh. There is, no, is there no relief in sight? This is gorgeous. This is beautiful. <laughs> is this the way you usually do it, Harry? Dessert after cheese? The acclaimed restaurant is devoted to the enjoyment of cheese, serving a daily selection of about 60 kinds of fresh and aged sheep's, cow's, and goat's milk cheeses. This world-class assortment of cheese is stored in a unique cheese cave at 48 degrees in 85% humidity. And Max McCallman is in charge of the restaurant's fromage. Here's what I need to know, man. Yes. What I, I don't know about these things, and I've never really met a guy who is an expert at cheese at a, at a restaurant. When I tell people, well, you gotta go to Pisolini, and you gotta have to have cheese from Max, and I said, he's like the, like the Grand Fromage. He's the, <laughs> I don't know, the what, Grand uh, th there must be a name for what you do. Uh, Mitre Fromager is the uh, French uh, title. Uh, we are more of an eclectic restaurant. The theme is French Mediterranean, uh, so that's the name, uh, Mitre Fromager. But we don't serve only French cheese, as you see. And so uh, I suppose that uh, perhaps uh, an American uh, translation of the title would be uh, more appropriate, such as uh, uh, Cheese Guy. Or <laughs>
or, or the cheese whiz or something. Cheese whiz? Yeah. No, no, that's already taken. There's a trademark on that. What, what's the most difficult say, aspect of your job? Uh, well, because we are trying to present a, a big uh, group of cheese to satisfy uh, various requests and uh, people that want to have a, a, a melange of unusual cheeses, that means that we have to uh, take a lot of time to take care of the cheese. It's, uh, there's a lot of work in uh, caring for cheese. Uh, what, they for like example? To, well, they would like to breathe, first of all, and some of them have been cooped up in, uh, in, in paper or plastic for weeks and they need to be unwrapped, they need to be turned, sometimes brushed or washed. Uh, they need to be uh, spoken to, uh, and uh, they like to be touched. Uh, they need a little TLC. Uh, without it, then they won't. <laughs> Sounds respond. like you, Bill. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm <laughs> a little cheese there. <laughs> Otherwise, they uh, they won't uh, they won't uh, be so good to you, and you want them to uh, present themselves uh, in their in their best uh, shape possible. So that means uh, uh, a lot of uh, working with them. The cheese guy explained the selection he'd made for us. Uh, yeah, you said you like goat's milk cheese, so I, I thought that uh, at the start of the plate, the one closest to you is one of the first of the Loire Valley goat's milk cheeses. Enjoy that mold. Delicious, salsouche, uh, kind of sweet, uh, creamy, uh, fairly mild, not too goaty. Uh, My then, first mold of the day. There you are. Uh, then uh, to, uh, to its left is a Keen's cheddar, one of the two remaining great farmhouse cheddars still in existence from mm. Somerset in southwest England, about a year old. Uh, the uh, cheese on the top left is a sheep's milk cheese from Spain. It's called Roncal, ancient type of cheese. They've been making it pretty much the same way for about 4,000 years. And on the top and it's right, it's worth it just to have them say Roncal. Roncal. <laughs> now th that cheese right there you're cutting to is a magnificent Swiss cheese, an Alpage. It is a uh, dense uh, quality cow's milk cheese, pretty strong aroma, the flavor is uh, just uh, com uh, complex. I have one last, I have a quick question. Yes. Max, have you ever had Velveeta? <laughs> yes, uh, I have it uh, at least at least twice a week, yes. I, I, it's Thanks. good food. Thank you. Thank you. The, the thing is about Max, you come to this restaurant, you've already had a great meal. Yeah. He comes along and all of these cheeses, he knows personally. He knows each intimate detail about these cheeses, where they come from. He spends his life hunting these things down. Wow. So he comes and he brings this tray and he delivers the news about the cheese with a kind of a passion and a knowledge. Oh, it's, and when it's a mission. I am on a mission, that's right, to I, rescue cheese. This, <laughs> this, this, this Swiss cheese yes. that I have here. Isn't it incredible? Had, I had about this much of this cheese and a tiny taste of wine, and I have a warmth coming from my stomach going all the way up close to my forehead. Wonderful. That's, uh, with that little nibble that you just put in your mouth is probably enough to sustain you for the next hour. <laughs> right there. Believe it or not. So I have a, I got a month's worth here then. Is there and, the show. See, and our wine, a Clos de Perrier Chain en Blanc 1995. See, it's a crisp wine, wine with a little residual uh, sugar. A well, uh, we food. drink to you. Thank you. Hang on. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you. Enjoy your cheese. Max, to your health and yours Thank as you. well. Now, Let's fast forward. Mm -hmm. If you and I could go back here to Pichon Lean, 10 years of our lives have gone by, mm -hmm. and we're doing another show together, having right. more wonderful cheese, and Max has got even better cheese. What do you want to be able to say about the 10 years of your life that have just passed? Um, you know, I just really finished my first documentary that I basically did that was mine. Mm -hmm. I want to have a lot more work like that behind me. Um, probably have done some, some writing. Um, I have a million stories to tell, and they're you know they're all locked up in here, and they're sort of waiting to get a, get onto a laptop somewhere, and so uh, that and you know that uh, your kids uh, managed to uh, do a little better than you did in high school. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we want. We Harry Smith, we we love to close each of our shows with a toast from our guests, right to the Food Network viewers, and it's your turn. Bill, I'll tell you what, this was an absolute pleasure. Likewise. And uh, if you're looking for someone to have a meal with, Bill's the guy. Oh, Here's the thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for bringing us to your favorite restaurant in New York City, Pichaline on 64th Street. To your health. Thank you. And your